Here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Today marks the 30th anniversary of a massive police operation in Philadelphia that culminated in the helicopter bombing of the headquarters of a radical group known as MOVE. The fire from the attack incinerated six adults and five children and destroyed 65 homes. Despite two grand jury investigations and a commission finding the top officials were grossly negligent, no one from city government was criminally charged. Here is how the bombing was initially reported in Philadelphia on WCAU radio. I've just been advised that we have new videotape of uh, the episode that apparently ended, we think ended, the uh, move situation tonight, the dropping of an incendiary device. And let's take a careful look at this 527 p.m. State Police helicopter drops it. There is the explosion. As you can see, a very dramatic explosion that occurs 30 seconds and really rips into the move compound. There you see the bunker, which soon will go up in flames. And that was the explosion close up. Now, if there's anybody there standing there, it's obvious they couldn't survive that explosion. That was WCAU TV, actually. We saw some video there. A move was a Philadelphia based radical movement dedicated to black liberation and a back to nature lifestyle. It was founded by John Africa, and all its members took on the surname Africa. In 2010, Ramona Africa, the sole adult survivor of the attack, told Democracy Now! what happened as the bomb was dropped on her house. In terms of the bombing, uh, after being attacked the way we were, first with four deluge hoses uh, by the fire department, and then tons of tear gas, and then being shot at, the police admit to shooting over 10,000 rounds of bullets at us in the first 90 minutes, um, there was a lull. You know, it was quiet for a little bit. And then, without any warning at all, two members of the Philadelphia Police Department's bomb squad got in a Pennsylvania state police helicopter and flew over our home and dropped a satchel containing C-4, a powerful military explosive that no municipal police department has. They had to get it from the federal government, from the FBI. And without any announcement or warning or anything, they dropped that bomb on the roof of our home. That was Ramona Africa, the sole adult survivor of the attack on MOVE 30 years ago today. Today, a memorial will take place at the site of the bombing on Osage Avenue. Well, for more, we're joined in Philadelphia by Lynn Washington, award-winning journalist, former columnist for the Philadelphia Tribune, who's covered MOVE since 1975. He teaches journalism at Temple University. Both he and Juan were there that day covering MOVE, uh, the MOVE bombing, for the Philadelphia Daily News. We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Lynn. Uh, talk about that day and, Juan, too, your memories. Uh, good morning, Amy. Uh, good morning, Juan. Uh, the one word that I would use to describe that day is surreal, to uh, have uh, witnessed a police firing 10,000 bullets within a 90-minute period. The bullets were so intense that they were raining from the sky like hail. And then later in the afternoon to see a bomb dropped on a house occupied by children, and then the very callous decision of the authorities to let the fire burn was just unreal. It's a, a, a sight and a memory that I can't get out of my mind. Uh, well, Lynn, I, I remember it was a Mother's Day, 1985, and uh, we were out there most of the day uh, and saw that helicopter uh, suddenly hover over the house and drop something. And I remember ta saying to you at the time, what, what's going on until the explosion occurred? But the, the most fascinating thing, as you said, uh, and most people are not aware, is how long before, uh, after the bomb dropped, before the firefighters even attempted to douse the flames that erupted? It was almost an hour, uh, because we were sitting there on Cobbs Creek Parkway, and you and I were both talking, and actually talking to some of the firefighters as to why they weren't doing it, and the firefighters didn't know. What they didn't—what they were told was to not fight the fire, which is unbelievable. And we could watch, or actually we saw, the fire go from what looked like the beginning of a, of a backyard barbecue grill uh, fire. Uh, to uh, a blazing inferno, and we just literally watched it 
jump across the roof lines and also across the street. So by the time that the decision was finally made to fight the fire, it was a blazing inferno, and it was totally out of control. And talk about who was in government, Juan, at the time. Who was the police commissioner? Who was the mayor? How did this bombing take place? The police bombed not just the move house. It ended up burning down two blocks, city blocks in well, Philadelphia. Well, yeah, because they didn't fight the fire, and it spread and destroyed the entire, you know, <laughs> square block area. But obviously, the, the, the mayor at the time, uh, uh, Lynn, was Wilson Good, the first African-American mayor of, of the city. And uh, the commission report later indicated that, that Good really wasn't in control of the situation. It was, it, it was the police commissioner and the fire commissioner. So Rizzo entirely? Uh, no, it wasn't Rizzo. It was the—who uh, yeah. was the police commissioner? I, I, it's been so long ago, I've forgotten. The police commissioner at the—yes, uh, I'm sorry. The police commissioner at the time was a guy named Gregor Sambor, and uh, he—Mayor uh, Good appointed him uh, because they were trying to purge the department in some way of the influence of Frank Rizzo, who had been the police commissioner and then the mayor during the 70s, when police brutality reached epidemic levels uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the things that, that gets lost in all of this is that, yes, there was this horrific bombing in the middle of May, May 13th, the day after Mother's Day in 1985. But uh, weeks, uh, actually a few days before the bombing, Sambor had ordered a anti-drug sweep that ended up arresting hundreds of people who were innocent, had nothing to do with drugs. The city ended up paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to settle that. And two weeks later, there was a dragnet in a Hispanic neighborhood where they were arresting people from 6 to 65 years old in an investigation involving the death of a police officer. And that death was initially reported as a domestic dispute between uh, a police officer, another police officer, and a police woman who was married to one of the police officers. Hmm. I want to go back to Ramona Africa, the sole adult survivor of the attack, describing what happened after the bomb was dropped on her house. And without any announcement or warning or anything, they dropped that bomb on the roof of our home. Now, at that point, we didn't know exactly what they had done. We heard the loud explosion. The house kind of shook, but it never entered my mind that they dropped a bomb on us, but the bomb did, in fact, ignite a fire. And uh, not long after that, it got very, very hot in the house, and the smoke was getting thicker. At first, we thought it was tear gas, but as it got thicker, it became clear that this wasn't tear gas, that this was something else. And then we could hear the trees outside of our house crackling and realized that our home was on fire. And we immediately tried to get our children, our animals, our dogs and cats, and ourselves out of that blazing inferno. Africa, sole adult survivor of the attack. So talk about who died, Lynn, uh, how people tried to escape, and what happened. Yes. Um the inside the house were, were uh, at that point, uh, five children aged 7 to 13 years old. They perished, along with six adults. One of the six adults was the founder of the MOVE organization, John Africa. Uh, a number of MOVE members tried to escape, and as you've indicated, uh, Ramona was the sole surviving adult. There was a child named Bertie Africa, who uh, later became Michael, uh, Michael Ward. Uh, they uh, were able to escape. When they were coming out, we heard gunfire. And it was later determined that police fired on the escaping move members, driving some of them back into the house. But in the convoluted logic that uh, many of us have seen over the last year from grand juries in uh, St. Louis County and in, in New York and uh, in uh, southern Ohio, where the guy was uh, shot in a Walmart, uh, the, the, uh, the grand jury, under the control of Philadelphia prosecutors, determined that MOVE members ran back into the House not because police were firing at them, but because they mistakenly believed that police were firing at them and or they ran back to intentionally commit suicide. And, and Lynn, what, did the, what were the main conclusions of the MOVE Commission that was established subsequent to the, that tragedy? 
Well, the MOVE Commission, which was a panel that the mayor Good had set up to investigate it, but had no power to do anything other than make recommendations, found monumental incompetence on the part of all city officials, from the mayor through the managing director to the police director, uh, the, or should I say the police commissioner. One of the findings, though, I think one of the most prominent findings was that the deaths of those children were unjustified homicides, and they recommended a, a criminal investigation and also charges to be brought. The grand jury determined that they were not uh, uh, unjustified homicides, that the deaths were, uh, as a result of this uh, uh, proposed or presumed suicide, and they came to many startling conclusions, one of which was the bomb that was dropped on the children. There was no illegality there, because the force of the bomb only applied to the adults in the house, as if the bomb could blow up and the fire could burn and it wouldn't impact the children. It was absolutely ridiculous, but it's the kind of convoluted reasoning we see too often with grand juries involving issues of police abuse. I wanted to turn to imprisoned journalist Mumia Abu-Jamal, who's being held at SCI Mahanoy. He reported extensively on MOVE before he was convicted of killing a police officer, crimes, a uh, crime he says he did not commit. Last month, he recorded a new essay for the 30th anniversary of the MOVE bombing from prison. May 13th at 30. Why should we care what happened on May 13th, 1985? I mean, seriously. That was 30 years ago, a long time ago, way back when. Know what I mean? Most people won't say that, but they think that. Why indeed? I'll tell you why. Because what happened then is a harbinger of what's happening now all across America. I don't mean bombing people, not yet, that is. I mean the visceral hatreds and violent contempt once held for move is now visited upon average people, not just radicals and revolutionaries like move. In May 1985, police officials justified the vicious attacks on MOVE children by saying they, too, were combatants in Ferguson, Missouri, as police and National Guard confronted citizens. Guess how cops described them in their own files? Enemies. Enemy combatants, anyone? Then look at 12-year-old Tamir Rice of Cleveland. Boys, men, girls, women. It doesn't matter. When many people stood in silence, or worse, in bitter acquiescence to the bombing, shooting, and carnage of May 13, 1985, upon MOVE, they opened the door to the ugliness of today's police terrorism from coast to coast. There is a direct line from then to now. May 13, 1985, led to the eerie RoboCop present. If it had been justly and widely condemned then, there would be no now, no Ferguson, no South Carolina, no Los Angeles, no Baltimore. The barbaric police bombing of May 13, 1985, and the whitewash of the murders of 11 moved men, women, and children opened a door that still has not been closed. We are today living with those consequences. From Imprisoned Nation, this is Mumia Abu-Jamal. Mumia Abu-Jamal recorded that commentary in prison. Last night, a prison nurse called Abu-Jamal's wife and told her he had been moved to the hospital for a second time this year. His supporters say they're concerned he had a fever and open wounds and sores on his leg. That does it for our show on this 30th anniversary of the MOVE bombing. Thanks so much to Lynn Washington in Philadelphia. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez for another—